Hi, everyone. It is so good to be with you for this installment in our series of Rule of Life, Living Life with Intention. So in this week's installment, we'll be discussing thought and thought so clearly interfaces with every other section that we've talked about. But we often don't give our thought any um, intentional attention. We often don't have awareness of the thoughts that we have going on. Um, we all have that internal dialogue. Um, I Maybe it should be a monologue. For me, it's a dialogue where there's this, this sort of internal conversation happening, but maybe um, going on in the background so that it's not at the forefront of my mind, but it's affecting the decisions that I make and the way that I interface with the world and um, the quality of the actions that I engage in and frankly um, influences whether we are living into the people that God is calling us to be. And um, sometimes that recording, we can have a recording running in our head, um, telling us things over and over again. And sometimes those recordings can be really unhelpful. And it can be important to dislodge those unhelpful recordings and replace them with something that's more generative and gentle and kind. Um, I actually had this experience myself where I realized that the recording running in my head was really negative. And I thought I would never talk to my best friend the way that I'm talking to myself. This is really actually counterproductive and maybe even destructive. And so with some work, I intentionally switched out what I was thinking. I intentionally started to talk to myself in my head <laughs> as I would talk to my best friend. And it, in a weird way, actually became my automatic sort of default. The default became this gentle, kind, um, subconscious sort of thing going on in the background all the time, to the point that when I was trying to parallel park, we were living in Virginia, and there is a lot of parallel parking in Northern Virginia, and it's not my strong suit, but I learned how to do it. But I was at a nursing facility that I needed uh, to go and visit a parishioner and I was trying to parallel park and there was some traffic behind me and I was feeling really uncomfortable and I realized that I was encouraging myself out loud <laughs> through the whole thing. It's like, come on, you can do it. Good job. Look at you backing up into that space. That's amazing. Way to go. And it was actually hysterical because I was like, oh, this is taking it to the next level where I have literally dislodged the negative talk and um, fully, <laughs> fully embraced the positive self-talk. But those thoughts really do change the way that we interact with the world and the expectations that we have of ourselves and that we have of others. And so um, when you're thinking about whether the things that you're saying to yourself in your own mind make any difference, they absolutely do. And in fact, I was just listening to a webinar this week on mind-body connection that not only are our thoughts themselves very important, not only is that sort of recording that we have running in the background important, but that our thoughts can actually manifest in our bodies. So that, for example, if we're thinking stressful thoughts, our heart rate will quicken, our blood pressure will go up. And especially in these times where anxiety is quite high, it is very helpful to be aware of your thoughts and to have an intentional coping mechanism. So if you find that your thoughts are sort of spinning to an anxious place, for example, or spinning to a place of panic that you can intentionally practice, for example, uh, deep breathing exercises that ground you and bring you back to this present moment and sort of anchor you. 
So our thoughts and our bodies are connected, our thoughts and our actions are connected, and our thoughts and our decision-making processes are connected. So giving some intentional uh, time and attention to our thoughts is a very helpful process. So in LaFon's book, he has the big heading of thoughts, and underneath that he has discernment and discretion, detachment, technology and media, study and formation, and failure. Now, when considering discernment and discretion, LaFon says discretion is our no and discernment is our yes. These come into play when we're talking about decisions that don't requ um, that require a higher level sort of emotional and spiritual sensitivity than the everyday decisions that we make that require some prayer and some real thought and some real time to make a good decision. And when we're discerning, it is better to discern from a place of faithfulness than a place of fearfulness. So when we're fearfulness and anxious, we're not able to really be attuned to the voice of God among us. It's much more difficult. Um, fearfulness sort of draws our attention to things that aren't part of what God would draw our attention to. So that shift back to faithfulness is very important. LaFon calls it making decisions from a place of peacefulness. And I think it's a very similar sort of thing that the making a, making a decision from a place of anxiety is not a good strategy. You want to be in a place where you've been able to um, be calm and thoughtful and reflective. And he also talks about the importance of trusting your gut so when you have done all of this work to become attuned to the presence of God in your midst, you should trust your gut when you're making a decision. And that means that um, if your gut says that something is wrong, you pause and turn prayerfully back around to consider that decision again. He says that, this is a quote, discernment is predicated on the expectation that God has hopes and longings for the life that we live. And he goes on to describe that he, that God also has hopes and longings for the lives of our sisters and brothers around us. And so there are ways that we are called to live in this world. And our discernment process acknowledges that God is present and that God has hopes and longings specifically for us. And it was interesting to me that he also emphasized discretion, what do you say no to? Um, and that our no is just as important as our yes. And that sometimes there may be things that seem on the surface that they're good, but if they're not good for you, the answer should still be no. So that sort of heightened awareness that we bring after doing all of this work and our rule of life, that heightened awareness we bring of the people that God is calling us to be, and then that invitation to turn ourselves around uh, towards living that life instead of some other life, some other path that may look good, but it's not our path. Um, I There was a story that came to mind with this, uh, which was just a story of when I failed at discernment and discretion. Um, we bought a house in 2006 and it was right before the crash. And I was studying public policy and public administration. And I knew the indicators that were saying that the market was overheated and that we ought not be uh, buying a house. I could tell that the market was overheated. I could tell that it was a terrible time to be buying, but um, we were concerned. Everyone was telling us we were going to be priced out if we didn't buy now. Uh, our families, our parents that we trust, who obviously had never seen 
what was going to come next in the following year. Um, our parents were excited for us to get a house, so we bought a house. My husband was super excited about it. And as we were sitting in the uh, loan officer's office, I uh, burst into tears. I was so upset. I just, my gut was just solidly against buying a house. And I was so embarrassed because I was just sobbing in front of this loan officer. And she was very awkwardly turning her attention to my husband <laughs> to sign the papers. I was a mess. And instead of being embarrassed, um, I probably should have actually listened to my gut. And my gut was saying, this is a terrible idea. And it turns out my gut was right. So listening to your gut is the right thing to do. And especially when you're trying to pray through something. And it is also something that many of us learn to do through trial and error. It's often something that we get better at because we were bad at it one time or more than one time. So the hope is that we continue to improve, but that is a very stark example of when I knew something was wrong and we did it anyway. And then um, our home lost a significant amount of its value, like 75% of its value. It was brutal. And um, if I knew then what I know now, I would have been like, you have no reason to be embarrassed about bursting into tears. You need to run, <laughs> grab a tissue and run out of there. <laughs> so, um, so that's one example of the importance of sort of paying attention to what your gut is telling you. And especially when you are being prayerful and if you're trying to be attuned to the work of God in your life, uh, that is a very, paying attention to your gut, to your emotions, is actually a very important indicator. Um, our world is constructed to tell us that our emotions don't matter, but actually our emotions uh, from very ancient traditions and the Christian faith, our emotions are an important indicator of right and wrong, of good and bad, of whether we're following the path correctly. Um, not that we should always be happy. The idea of our emotions being important doesn't mean that God wants us to be having a party all the time. That's not the indicator. But the indicator of um, peace and consolation, the sort of um, ability to recognize when you're on the path to which you've been called, which uh, goes into the next topic of detachment. Um, so Lafon says detachment means that we live with cool, open hands rather than sweaty and clenched fists. So recognizing that changes in our lives are actually normal, that though as humans, we long for things to um, be, we long for the ability for uh, things to be stable and secure, but change is really the only constant in life. And so how we greet that change becomes an important spiritual practice. Are we able to greet the changing circumstances of our life rooted in faith in God? where we welcome with gratitude those gifts and blessings in our life and are able to gently let go of things when we no longer have access to them. So friendships or uh, money. How do we encounter the changing circumstances of our life? And um, detachment is an ongoing process, but being detached means that we're able to welcome things and to let them go and to recognize the ebb and flow of life as normal instead of trying to cling to things that aren't meant to be clung to. If we recognize and trust that God is with us, we don't have to cling 
to things that we ought not cling to. Uh, there's a book called Radical Gratitude, and I didn't jot down the author's name, but I believe it's Ellen something. She's great. The book is great, and it's written in um, a series of stories, short stories. So she writes about encountering different people who have been able to express gratitude in the midst of hardship, in the midst of unexpected circumstances, where the rest of us might find it very difficult. I know in some of the stories that she shares, I, it's a remarkable gift of faith and trust that people have displayed in the midst of hardship. It's a great book um, called Radical Gratitude. And it really speaks to that idea of detachment, that regardless of the circumstances of our life, we know that God is with us and our anchor is in God alone. And um, we may feel happy or we may feel sad, but those things come and go and that's not the core of who we are. Uh, detachment is a lifelong process. It's not... Um, it takes real intention and real practice. Um, the next chapter that LaFont suggests is technology and media. And that seems like a really, especially a pertinent uh, topic given our lived experience right now. Um, his question is, what are some healthy boundaries for you around technology and media that honor who you are and who you are called to be. And I find this to be important always, but even more deeply important now. Um, our news cycles are that sort of 24 seven news cycle can really interfere with our sense of, um, normalcy, or it can amplify things uh, in a way that's sometimes helpful and sometimes not helpful. And so figuring out how to be present in this moment of your life and this world is really important. And also recognizing that not every person is called to everything. So recognizing what you are called to and doing that work and then um, closing off, sort of closing the valve to things that you're not called to can be really helpful. And in some ways, I think that the practices are really very simple, just simply deciding that you're not going to consume um, more than 30 minutes or an hour of news every day. There was a webinar, I know I talked about it before, um, that was done for clergy sort of in the midst of pandemic, how do we stay connected? And one of the recommendations of the psychologist who is leading that was that she actually tells her clients no more than 30 minutes of news a day. Um, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> 30 minutes seems like a very small amount. But having a boundary that works for you that you name and are intentional with can be really helpful. So for me, um, an hour is usually about right. Um, having some boundaries around Facebook is also important for me right now. Um, it's Facebook is both very helpful and very unhelpful. And the emotional energy that goes into sort of managing uh, encounters on social media can be really disproportionate to what's happening in my real life. So that emotional energy, drawing a boundary, what is healthy for me is really important because social media is not going to do that for you. It's always there. It's always accessible. It's always um, interesting. It's always going to be emotionally provocative. It's always going to be you something happy and something not happy side by side in your newsfeed. So social media doesn't draw any boundaries for you. You have to draw those boundaries for yourself. And so figuring out 
what is good for you. Although some fixed boundaries are good, but they can also be flexible, just sort of situational. As you realize you're overwhelmed, it is okay to turn things off. So having sort of set boundaries, for example, no more than an hour of news a day. Um, another boundary that in normal life is also just lovely is to say that when you're eating dinner together with family or friends, cell phones just don't come out. Um, it's a lovely boundary that allows us to be present with people that we're choosing to be with and that we love and um, having the attention of everyone at the table being on one another is a lovely and good and life-giving thing. So in times of normalcy, when we're able to gather together again, it's a lovely boundary to observe. Um, but also being aware of those situational boundaries that that you need for yourself, for your own health and well-being is very important. I'll say the uh, other boundary that's helpful is when do things get turned off before you go to sleep so that you're not, um, your brain isn't still working on those bright screens. Uh, having some boundaries around that is great. And having some boundaries with your Sabbath is also great. So um, for example, do you have a period of Sabbath and does your Sabbath include um, just no email and no text messages for that day or no email for that day or whatever it is that's a healthy boundary for you that helps you to be intentionally present so that technology is a tool that you use and you don't become consumed by it. Um, so the next uh, topic that LaFond suggests, the next chapter, is study information. And that kind of nicely follows boundaries around technology because sometimes study information includes access to technology, to TED Talks or to podcasts, or hopefully to these videos as you're working on your rule of life. And sometimes study information looks like intentionally turning the TV off and giving your attention to something that's more fruitful and meaningful for you. So when thinking about boundaries around study and formation, it can be helpful to consider what makes you curious, what makes you, uh, when you invest in something, what makes you feel like you're growing, what excites you and calls to you, and what helps you move into the person that God is calling you to be. And setting aside some time for study and formation is um, essential and if you want to live into that growth, if you want to live into who you're called to be. Um, the things that we read and the things that we consume so influence our thought processes. And if you're not making time to intentionally engage with thinkers that you respect or with people that you admire or with ancient texts or with texts that you struggle with, those things um, make us grow, they make us better people, and if you're not intentionally setting aside time, you're missing out on that opportunity for growth. So um, I often find for myself that it takes real intention to set aside time for study and formation. And I'm somebody that I don't have the demands of a family, um, I don't have a lot of the demands that other people have, and it's still, days can easily be consumed with other work, with paying bills, with running errands, with all of the other things of life that make life up. But life is richer and more interesting, and our thoughts are more complex and nuanced, and we engage in the world differently if we take the time for study and formation. And um, hopefully study and formation makes us kinder and more generous and more compassionate and uh, allows us to engage with the world 
in a more um, centered way. So study information is basically saying, what are you curious about? And why don't you feed and nourish your soul with those things that are interesting to you and that you want to learn more about? So the last topic that LaFond includes is failure. And he acknowledges that most people do not want to talk about failure. We see failure in this really shame-based way, as though there's something wrong with, with us for failing. And it's a curious thing because each of us, if we've risked anything, has experienced failure. And if we're not willing to risk, I mean, if we say we're never going to experience failure, failure is terrifying and forget it, well, then we never risk anything. We never try anything that's difficult or take a step outside of our comfort zone. And so failure ought not to inspire fear or shame. Failure is really an opportunity to learn. And Lafon talks about the temptation in our society to self-anesthetize, that if we experience failure, that we can sometimes want to dull the pain that that brings. But if we instead encounter failure as a learning opportunity, then failure becomes not something to be feared, but actually um, a friend even that can teach us something about ourselves. He says... Um, that failure teaches us who we are, but if we do not face our failures, they become who we are. I thought that was really lovely. Failure teaches us who we are, but if we do not face our failures, they become who we are. So friends, you are so much more than any failure that you've ever encountered. They are not who you are. Failure is not who you are. Worst choice scenario, the worst case scenario. That's when we bought our house. Um, it was an utter failure. It was awful. It's an awful experience. We um, just uh, experienced huge financial losses from that and um, a lot of grief because we had had some dreams and hopes that we had put into that home. And uh, it was just sad. But that failure, confronting that sadness and that grief, uh, actually really taught us something. And confronting that failure especially taught me that um, I should trust my gut. So um, don't fear failure. Confront failure and let it teach you. So... The goal of this section of the rule of life on thought is to first draw your attention to your internal dialogue, thinking through what thoughts might be playing in your mind that you're not even really aware of, and intentionally turning your thoughts, that internal dialogue, to a constructive place that honors the person that you are and the person that God is calling you to be. The second sort of hope is that by paying attention to your thoughts, by giving real um, attention and intention to them, that you can observe boundaries that are healthy for you and that allow you to grow into the person that God who loves you and who has called you from birth is calling you into being now. So what are those boundaries that will help you to be healthier and to help you to be more observant and to help you to live more faithfully? So the idea with this section, the hope with the entirety of the rule of life really is that by drawing our awareness to these topics, we can think through what healthy boundaries look like for us. Boundaries that aren't meant to confine 
or punish or just smush, <laughs> smush you together. But, but boundaries that are meant to sort of help remind us of what our healthier, better self can look like. So observing those boundaries, paying attention to your well-being, paying attention to the way that your thoughts influence your actions will help you to be more faithfully the person that God has called you to be.